Urban Agriculture, episode number three, The Second Green Revolution, Paradise Lost. Urban Agriculture, episode number three, recorded on April 1st, 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. Is your middle name like Green Thumb? Uh, no, but I could <laughs> change it to that. <laughs> Hi, Dixon. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Nice to see you again on it's, this uh, rather nice day here in New York City. You know, what a change of events over the last week. It has gotten very springy, hasn't it? It has. In fact, I saw my first bloom the other day. This morning, I noticed the crocuses and the daffodils are popping up through the you got it the mulch. You can't keep them down. I mean, <laughs> you can delay them, but you can't prevent them. <laughs> and also, today is April Fool's Day. It is. In fact, it's really snowing outside. That's right. <laughs> no, it's it's pleasant. It's in the high forties, threatening to get up into the lower fifties. It's overcast a little bit. It looks like you could have a little sprinkle every now and then, which would be great in the spring. We did have some Ooh, intense rain. We had a lot of rain over the weekend. We had a lot of rain. In fact, uh, every river in the Northeast was in flood stage about three days ago. This would be perfect weather if we were planting. You know, it? farmers pray for rain until they get too much, and then they pray for sun until <laughs> they get too much, and then they pray for... <laughs> Is there anything we can do about that? And you know, can talk a lot about the weather, but you can't really do much I about see. it. Except that we are changing the climate, which we will get to, by the are way. Are we going to get to that in this <laughs> yeah, we, series? Yeah. yeah, I think the whole series is about that, actually. The reason why we're talking about urban agriculture is because it begs the need for a different strategy to produce food for about half of the world right now. What is the world's population, by the way? Well, I don't know exactly, but uh, sometime about six months ago, it passed the 7 billion mark. So we should be well over yeah. seven billion. Seven point one five three, sorry um, four, oops. sorry five <laughs> billion. <laughs> Actually, the, you know, if you go down <laughs> to New York City to Twenty Third Street and Union Square, yeah, which is I think where that is. There's a big, gigantic billboard that actually has the world's population. I don't need it. I can get one on the internet. Going like crazy. Look at that. It just it just keeps spinning. It just keeps spinning. Kids are born every second, That's right. more or less. What right? is that website again? It's from the census. U.S. Census. It is census.gov. It's there right on go. the front page. We're going to put this in the show notes. So what happens when the one death birth, rate changes? One birth every eight seconds, one death every 12. So right. that is the death has got to increase. It's got to go down in frequency, uh, increase in frequency, go down in time. Otherwise, the population is going to keep growing. The population has continued to grow since the advent of... This is civilization. This is a great site. I've never seen this. It is, site. but that's you know that's what it is. What it is. Oh, Dixon, you know <coughs> we don't need your negativity. <laughs> no, no, we, no. Do you know who the the Not top five most populous countries are? I know oh, you know what number one. I'll is. just throw in a guess here: China, China, right? India, correct? Russia, no. Uh, United, States. United States. He's pointing to himself. That's through immigration, though. That's not through growth of population, by the way. Uh, the non-immigrant portion of the United States has remained pretty stable. We have a migrant every 38 seconds here in we the U.S. We have a US. lot of people coming in. That's true. They think it's better here. Yeah. Brazil it is, is, it pretty, is pretty good. Country. I turn on the faucet and I get clean water. You know, that's Brazil is number five. Indonesia yeah. is number four. Amazing. Then we have Pakistan, Nigeria. Wow. I'm surprised at Nigeria. Nigeria is about so 76 or 78 177 million. 177. Bangladesh is number eight. Russia is ninth. Ninth, okay. And rounding out number 10, a it rather is. small island nation. But with a lot Japan. of people in Japan. That's there you it. go. There you go. You know, we could have a radio show. <laughs> <laughs> we, do, we do well together. You, uh, we've, you we've listen, well together. you play off me, I play off we've you. We've done well together from the start of our podcasting, which started how long ago now? And now we should have two cameras in here <laughs> on us. No, we'd gross out the audience. <laughs> you would. <laughs> I, I, for sure I would. That's for sure. So when when this was is our, our first podcast, by the way, ever? The first one we ever recorded, September yes. 2008. Wow. Uh, I came wow. to your office. We recorded This Week wow. in Virology. Wow. And uh, something went wrong, and halfway through it <laughs> stopped right. recording. Exactly so right. I had to come back the next week and 
pick up. That was quite. And we overlapped a lot because we really didn't matter. remember. Didn't really matter. And then I put it together. Hopefully, we've gotten better at that since then. Twiv number one. It's still there on the wow. internet. Wow. Crazy. It's always free Crazy. and always will be. So there was a, it was a virologist versus a non-virologist, and it probably still is. <laughs> no, I don't know why you agreed to do that with me. I thought it would be fun, actually. I was flattered that you asked. You probably didn't even know what you were getting into. I had no idea it would develop into something like this. Would you agree that I revolutionized your life? You changed it. <laughs> I'm not sure you revolutionized it. but <laughs> All right. Well, I changed it. I I'm got still revolving. How's that? Okay. This is episode three of Urban Agriculture, right. and we are, we right. are not yet on iTunes no. because uh, Dixon and I are arguing about the artwork still. We're not arguing. We're having, We're having a, a creative and, discussion. That's right. that's right. And then as soon as that's sorted out, we'll, I will submit it to iTunes. Yeah. And, It'll be up soon, I'm sure. I, I, but we, we do have a website, and I haven't yet built that. I right. could actually put the first episode on the website, but could I'm waiting that. to get the artwork yeah because i want to make a header okay there's some creativity involved in all this i mean it's not just slap it together there is some or, i'd like to be considered i i have learned a bit in all the websites and podcasts that i've made and i like to apply that to this one and make it a high quality you have thing. high standards i must say i don't like to slap things up no. and be be no. shoddy no your whole professional life has been like that vincent i do um, i do take care in what i put my name on you do if it says me then i want it to be quality i hear you and i'm i'm equally uh, stringent with regards to that so we can take our time and only have to do it once well you can always improve but i think you should start right. out on a good foot you're absolutely right. all right so last time would yeah, you like a we? recap that's right sure let's get a recap here last time we were discussing the second green revolution we yep. continued that we had actually reached that in the first episode that's right. That's right. and we talked about how uh, the government helped to establish universities and land grant universities yep. and so forth and Technical we, talk, universities. we talked about how land was given to people that's right in the midwest to farm them yep we talked a little bit about urea and the development of processes that help fertilization that's we right. talked about tractors yep. and we talked about the midwest the the uh, exactly the the problems there and it became exactly. a dust bowl. They, they yep. farmed without fertilizing, right? right? And right. Uh, they farmed in an area which really shouldn't have had farming. And it was with. dry, and so people lost their uh, businesses and they moved to Some California. Some of them lost their lives, Vincent. and they moved to California where they were called That's right. Okies. That's correct. And you said no one returned to the. We, we ended on this note. No one returned right. to the dust bowl That's until right. after World War II. That is correct. Because just after the dust bowl occurred. Mm -hmm. And just after the Great Depression, that depression wasn't just part of the United States. It was worldwide. So it was global. Right. And as a result of that, um, there was discontent in many areas. And people blamed other people on things that had nothing to do with that particular thing. Uh, for instance, lots of ethnic groups were just dis – dis let's, let's try this again. A lot of ethnic groups were uh, discriminated against – from the standpoint of an economic argument that they're draining the country of resources and sending them back to so-and-so or they're hoarding certain uh, minerals or hoarding certain uh, economic uh, issues that uh, related to the poor people that didn't have anything and, and, were, and they were different. I'm, I'm trying to be general about this, but obviously everybody knows that in Germany at least, the Jews were blamed for all of the economic woes that the German people were suffering from the same depression that we were suffering from as well. They solved their problem, or attempted to solve their problem in a completely different way, which was important, and that is to just get rid of those people, which was just the worst thing that humanity could ever do to itself. On the other hand, we um, looked around and, and sort of came up with something called the New Deal, which was a... Franklin Delano Roosevelt plan to get us out of the depression. They ended up hiring uh, disparate uh, occupations like uh, artists, for instance. They put them to work doing public works projects and that sort of thing. So we tried to make work where there wasn't any to keep those people busy so that when economic times turned better, they would have jobs waiting for them. Okay. It's so a wonderful didn't always restaurant work. on the Pacific not too far from San Francisco, and that highway that runs along the Pacific. Yeah, that's the El Camino Real. So there's a very nice restaurant where when you walk in, there's a mural 
Oh yeah, a works project right. administration's mural. That's right. You know the style. Sure. Right? It's kind of blocky. Sure. sure. But painted by these these artists you're talking about. Who became world famous artists. You yeah. know, Kandinsky. Thomas uh, Hart Benton. Is he one of Thomas them? Thomas Hart Benton was one of those people. And there's a whole bunch of uh, 1930s uh, artists who uh, whose works still stand on the walls of many, many uh, structures throughout the United States and other places too. Um Maybe Thomas Howard Benton wasn't right. He's, he was at the forefront of the regionalist movement. Well, that's true, but he painted during that era. And uh, But many, many other artists uh, applied their trade and kept busy. Here's some of the Works Progress administrations. Yeah, yeah. I have a whole list of them. Oh, come on. Uh, Regale us. <laughs> Berenice Abbott. You right? should know that name. Go on. I'm looking for names that I well, recognize. Thomas, Thomas Hart Benton. He's on Thomas the list. Thomas Hart Benton yeah. painted rural agricultural scenes. Yes. And and romanticize the idea of farming. I don't um, William William de Kooning. Exactly. Not a not a name you'd associate primarily with muralists, but uh, indeed he's there. Well they were called WPA right. painters. Diego are, Rivera isn't there because he's not from this country, but neither were there these other people either. They were refugees from these hard Mark Rothko. Marcus Rothkovich, that was his real Mark, name. Mark Rothko, Jason Pollock, That's Jackson right. Pollock, Jackson. I'm sorry. But those, are, those were later on. Those guys existed yeah. later on. Okay, those are the 50s and 60s artists that revolutionized art in general. But, but Kandinsky was one of those people who came to this country and, and sought refuge here. Pete Mondrian was another one that uh, came from uh, Amsterdam and uh, painted some wonderful modern art. Hmm. Uh, so... So the point, the point is that, that art wasn't the only way of keeping people busy. Uh, we had people planting trees. We had people uh, helping to build roads. Uh, we, but it wasn't enough. It just wasn't enough because farming in general had failed. And why was that? Because so production was way down after it, the Yeah, depression. it was way down. And not only was uh, there, there were no jobs, but there was no food. So this is mainly because of the Dust Bowl failure? Yeah. That and was we a, hadn't yet established farming in California. It was there. It was starting. Germinating. It was, <laughs> good, good way to put it. It's hard to avoid analogies to growth of plants when yeah. you're talking about plants. <laughs> I think I was so Alan Dove. Wouldn't we're we? going to try, try not to do that, but it's going to be hard. Well, I, so, actually, it was an accident. I didn't do it on purpose. <clears throat> right. So the, the California Imperial Valley was not in full swing when the Okies from Oklahoma arrived, when the immigrants arrived mm -hmm. from, the, from the Dust Bowl. But, but they all were attempting to get jobs. So there was a book that we began to talk about, and that was The Grapes of Wrath, written by John Steinbeck. And that book was an historical record, basically, through uh, uh, historical fiction, using real events but with not real people mm -hmm. to illustrate what it was like to live what I would call at the end of the second agricultural revolution. It was the end of the second. It was the end, really? How could that be the this end? Is, you're talking about after the Depression was the end? Yeah. So these the Grapes of Wrath documents yeah. a family that went from the, the Dust Jodes. Bowl to, That's right. to California. California. And they and encountered other problems. Me. Remember the other problems they encountered oh, when they got All to California? There were labor issues. There yeah. was competition from other people Huge who were there already. Yeah. It was horrible to be a farmer in those days. And, and so on the backdrop of that, think of all those wonderful folk singers that we have come to appreciate, you know, like Ramblin' Jack Elliott and uh, Woody Guthrie and um, Pete Seeger, who just recently passed away. There's all those who has the boat on the Hudson here. Yeah, that was Pete Seeger. No more boat, huh? The boat's still there, sure. The clear well, you, you and I have seen it, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, we have many times, mm -hmm. many times. So those songs, the reason why they became popular was because they started to chronicle what was going on in music rather than in words like Steinbeck did. But those, those were kindred, kindred souls because they talked about the same issues. Man. Human rights, the availability of resources, the misuse of resources, the, uh, the drive towards... Um, commercializing something that, to be honest, if you're another animal uh, living in a colony and you're a colonial animal, you get your fair share. That's what the colony does. And yeah. we live in colonies, but we don't give people the fair share. Though. So you're not, you're not listening to the voice of a communist or a, a socialist or anything else. I'm, I'm a biologist. And if you take a biological view of human beings, it's uh, very difficult to make an analogy between the way we live and the way other animals 
and even plants that are cooperative live. So it's hard to find altruism sometimes in human behavior. That's all I'm saying. And certainly when it comes to farming, everybody gets their fair share of here's my plot of land, here's, the, here's how I farm. Mm -hmm. And if I have a better year than you do, even though the weather conditions are the same and I planted the same way you did, but I did a little something different mm -hmm. to make my crop grow, I, I'm not going to share that with you. I'm going to use that as an advantage, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little bit better than you did. And so that, that little bit better attitude uh, sort of spilled over into the second half of the second green revolution, and that mm -hmm. was the industrialization of farming. No, it didn't. So the second green revolution didn't end, you say. It didn't end, but there was, there was you a, could tell it was going to end by looking at the way farming was char characterized during that okay. depression period. And somehow we rescued it. As we you're tried tell to us. rescue it, and we tried to rescue it using technology. Okay. okay. What kind of technology? All kinds. Uh, better tractors, uh, more efficient fertilizers, uh, better irrigation schemes, mm -hmm. uh, more selected crops that were resistant to certain plant diseases that we could uh, count on growing rather than uh, hit or miss uh, in terms of planting strategies, etc. There were a whole slew of things that resulted. And in the 60s, with the discovery of the gene and the discovery of the chromosomes, which was, by the way, first done in plants, as you know, before animal genetics, there was plant genetics, and that started with Gregor Mendel. And Gregor Mendel set the tone. He didn't know what a gene was. He didn't know what chromosomes were. But later on, it became apparent that what he was looking at was clearly driven by processes which we have come to fully understand now. Once that knowledge became available through the Watson and Crick uh, finding of the DNA as the, uh, the genetic material, we could begin to manipulate it. And at that point... Right. These, so in 1944, we learned... That's right. ...that the DNA of bacteria is the informational molecule. Right. And then in 53, Watson and Crick solved the structure. Right. And for the first chromosomes, I think, that they understood what they were doing was actually seen in plants. Now, have had they been breeding in agriculture before this? Of course. Of course. And Luther Burbank did most of his work during the uh, 20s and 30s and 40s. And, Who's Luther Burbank? Uh, Luther Burbank is a big hero. Um, he's, right. he's one of the big heroes of hybrid plants and uh, grafting one species of plant onto another and getting uh, crosses between peaches and um, plums and getting a new kind of, you know, I'm making this up right now because I don't know the details, but, but to Luther Burbank, and they've named a city after him in California, mm. of course, where the movie industry is currently located. Um, Luther Burbank was a plant biologist who mm. uh, created lots of hybrid plants, which still today are the ones that we have come to uh, eat, like a nectarine, for instance, which isn't really a wild plant that was domesticated. It's mm -hmm. two different wild plants that were put together to make a different mm. uh, offspring, you know, like a horse and a donkey making a mule or things right. like that. Hmm. So <clears throat> Luther Burbank was one of many heroes that did this too. There was uh, activity that was occurring in Italy, right? And so broccoli. Broccoli is a hybrid plant that was never in existence before. It was made before. in Italy? Yeah, I believe that's true. You can, uh, you can look this up on your Funk and yeah. Wagnall, as they used to say. <laughs> so broccoli is a hybrid plant. It's a cruciferous plant. <laughs> it's, a, it's, the, it's the plural of broccolo, which a is broccolo, Italian. Broccolo, broccolo. And, and it, it's a delicious plant. Most people like it's it. It's a result so. of careful breeding of cultivated leafy crops in the northern Mediterranean, but this See is the 6th century B.C., Dixon. This is way before your well, second you know, evolution. <laughs> That's still part of the first degree. It was brought month. to England from Antwerp in the mid-18th century, introduced to the U.S. See that? In the 1920s. Okay. So okay. just when yeah. we had our depression. That's right. Well, the depression no, was no, 1930. No, no. That was the roaring 20s. This is, uh, you know. Broccoli. Broccoli. So and they tried to kickstart agriculture by all these mechanical and hybridization right. techniques. And, and, and it's called did artificial it selection. Did it work? In many cases, yes. Of course it did. You know, selecting wheat that grows better in colder temperatures, uh, selected for winter wheat, for instance, and we now mm -hmm. have a huge crop of winter wheat every year. So uh, when did we get out of the agricultural funk that was instilled by the Depression? Well, after the Second World War, because of all the... Really? Yeah, after the Second World War, mm. the technological breakthroughs that occurred during the Second World well, War... Well, of course, when you have war industry, you develop new things, and right? what was the one item 
which we were missing before the Second World War, which we had after the Second World War, which said we can do anything we want, anywhere we want. What was that? The atomic bomb? No, well, that's, <laughs> that was a great guess, by the way. I, would have, I probably would have said that too, but this is something to do with agriculture. But before that, it was something to do with disease control. And it's not Jeez. penicillin. No, that came to my mind, but no, I know we don't use that in plants. You know right? what else is happening here? I'll, I'll take you back to Anzio. The, the beach in uh, Italy. That's right. Where we f- first landed. That's correct. Yeah. Why did we succeed? Do you remember why? No. no. Well, because the troops that landed there didn't get epidemic typhus. Mm-hmm. And what is that carried by? Tick. A louse. Yes. A louse? A louse. That's right. Louse-born typhus. So the difference between a tick and a louse. Uh, plenty I know I'm a louse. A louse, a, is a, a louse is a... <laughs> I've been accused of being a louse, but no. Louse, lice are insects. Lice. Sorry. They are three-legged... Ticks are arthropods. Six-legged, and the, the other ones are four-legged. That's right. So, But the point is that, that uh, lice, body lice, not head lice, mm-hmm. body lice carry epidemic typhus. And pe- lots of people die from now, it. Now, we were able to land in Anzio because we didn't have lice. No, we had lice, all right. But we but treated we them rid of them with. You tell me, penicillin. You don't treat lice with penicillin. Yeah, I wouldn't no. think you would. What would you treat them with? Well, the typhus is a bacterium inside them, right? So you could treat the troops with penicillin, but I don't know if that works no, against no, typhus. No, that's, that's prophylactically. No, you, are you spraying you, them with, with? Uh, DDT? There. So we had DDT. We did, uh, which would allow, which was developed for World War II. That's right, and this allowed us to decontaminate crops. No, it allowed us to decontaminate troops. Well, first. yeah, but after the war was over, so a lot of the a lot of the Germans died from epidemic typhus because they didn't have access to DDT. Yeah, that's remarkable, right? So it, it actually allowed the invasion to occur. So the point is that once the war was over, do you know what they discovered? It was discovered by a Swiss chemist in 1939. That's, right. that's exactly 1939, propitious date. And the Swiss were neutral, so they say. <laughs> wow. After the war, DDT was made available for use as an agricultural Right. You know why they discovered that? And you know what happened after that? He got the Nobel Prize. Uh, of course. And you know what happened around the Mediterranean basin? What? They used it to get rid of the mosquitoes, too. So malaria was a big deal, right? In uh, the Mediterranean. That's right. You know what else disappeared yeah. at the same time? Leishmaniasis. You know why? Because it's, tra- it's transmitted by... A sand fly. Now, this yeah, yeah. sounds like a twip. <laughs> it's wow. not a twip. I like the way about, things are intertwined. They have to come together. They have to come together. A perfect storm. That's right. That's right. So DDT was looked at as the panacea for insect pests of all kinds. So farmers started using it? Of course. To get rid the United of the States pests. Department of Agriculture said, my God, we, we've got something that will prevent our crop losses. What kind of pests did we have in the U.S. that Let's, were making well, crop losses? Well, there's an enormous list. Mm-hmm. You can start with something as benign as the Japanese beetle, which was an in- introduced species, by the way. I thought that came in the 60s. <clears throat> it did. But we're talking about post-World War II. We're going to talk about the corn borer. How about aphids? Aphids were a big deal also for grape They still crops. are. They still are. That's right. Because we don't so use DDT There's anymore. a lot of aphids, or aphids as you call them. <laughs> <laughs> What's the right na- way to say well, it? Aphids are fine. Uh, all, all, either or is... Uh, either or is is a good oh. pronunciation, but but if you look up plant pests, all right, mm-hmm. in, plant insect pests, you'll have an enormous list. Every species of commercially grown crop has its own pests. Every one of them, lots um, of. So them. did this help us to make better in farming practice? In the yeah. beginning, yes. So what what did we do? Sprayed this plants, sprayed. right? And what were we growing in the U.S. now everything, after the world? Everything, we everything. Had to grow everything, and not not only that, the population actually dipped a little bit during the war, but it it rebounded tremendously afterwards, and they call them baby boomers. Right. Right? Now, I used to think I was a baby boomer because I was conceived in 1940. I am. I'm a 53, right? But you're a 50. You're a boomer. Yeah. But you're you're a late bloomer. <laughs> no, no, sorry. I'm so, an early bloomer. Um, <laughs> boomer, boomer. We meant boomers. So they started to use DDT <laughs> to control virtually every one of these insect pests. I have a poster I found here of Plant pests full of sure. bugs of sure. various sorts. Of source. course, of course, of course. Flanzen Schaudlin. <clears throat> That's right. And you know what they used to say? Plant pests. They used German. to say DDT is good for you and me. 
DDT is good for you and me. That's right. Wow. So they started to use it indiscriminately. That's the word I want to use here, indiscriminately. So it contributed to the second Green Revolution because in the beginning, let's say in the 1950s and 1960s, DDT looked as though it could actually extinct species of insect pests. Mm -hmm. Certainly made a big impact on... But what do you dengue, know about that process? Dengue, because uh, oh, sure. we got rid of the mosquito, and then after we banned DDT, dengue uh, came back. So, But tell me what happened to the insect pests that we were trying to get rid of with DDT. What do you think happened, Vince? Well, I would guess, and I don't really know, that they got resistant. Really? But th that's no. not why we banned it. I Stop. mean, we, we wouldn't have banned it if they were just getting resistant. People would have stopped using it. I know we, we banned it because, do you want to drop this bomb? Go for it. Certain kinds of birds were were concentrating DDT, and their shells were being fragile, and their offspring, the, the bald eagle, almost went you. extinct. Look right? At you. So what you're actually saying is that DDT was concentrated up through the food web or yes. food chain. Correct. Which one? I would say the food web. You are right in some cases, and in others, so it's let's the food track it. Change. Who ate? Where did the DDT first go into copods? It went into let's. <laughs> Let's imagine that indiscriminate spraying will yes. allow it to concentrate in anything. So in an aquatic environment, a freshwater aquatic environment, it could probably get into the algae. Okay, and who eats algae? Filter feeders. And who eats filter feeders? Predators. What would a bird eat that would have? Which PGT? bird? Let's say bald eagle. It's a prey. Bald eagle is actually a scavenger. Yeah, they are scavengers. They eat yeah. dead things. Mostly. Correct. They, they sometimes catch fish, but they mostly eaten something that died, like a salmon along the river in the Pacific Northwest, yeah, for instance. Right. That's what they're best known for. But osprey mm -hmm. catch fish. Osprey is a kind they of have, a bird of prey for, for the ocean area. That's right. right. They have mm -hmm. talons that almost reconnect back underneath their legs. They have talons. They have talons. Oh, sorry. Talons, talons. <laughs> <laughs> right. We do make a good pair here. Sorry. So when they grab a hold of a fish, mm -hmm. they can't let go. So well, they have to really make sure they bring that the they fish to the catch nest, right? the right fish. By the way, I'll put a picture that I took of one on the internet for you on this show. The internet? What's that, Dixon? Well, that's something that was invented by Al Gore, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the fish has joking. already concentrated the DDT, right? That's right. And then the bird is eating it, uh, passing right. it onto its eggs. You got it. And so, got not to the egg. It actually, it's part of the eggshell formation process that yeah. it interferes with. So they were laying partially hardened eggs that just dried out because the eggshell couldn't protect them against the uh, outside conditions. Is that so the, the main reason we banned DDT? Well, not in the beginning. No, not in the beginning. So, Banned while, was in 1972, I think. While this was occurring, there were biologists all over the country paying attention to what was going on, and they were alarmed. There was one in particular. You can drop this bomb, too, if you'd like, whose name is almost a household word, among the ecological cognoscente. I know the book is Silent Spring. Silent. Why do you think it was called Silent Spring? Spring is a babbling brook type of thing, right? Or it's when spring... Do you know that little rhyme? No, what's the spring rhyme? Spring has sprung. Yes. The grass has riz. I don't know why it was called Silent Spring. I wonder where the boydies is. Oh, there's no birds singing. Right. Because they were... Wiped out by DDT. That's right. So there were, and this young woman who wrote it was a, was working for the FDA. Is that correct? Uh, we'll have to look that one up to make sure. But, but you I, know, you and I talked about this not too too long ago. I thought she was working for the U.S. Wildlife Service. But Rachel Carson. That's correct. Published in 1962. Si 62. 62. Yeah. She had been uh, working, yeah, for for the. Uh, Wait a minute here. She had been concerned about the use of pesticides, right? right. About the overuse of pesticides. Correct. She was a Fish and Wildlife Service and wildlife employee. Service. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so she was sort of close to the whole, to whole thing. She there. was right in the middle of it, in fact. And, and she did a lot of studies along the shorelines of New England. And she was a wonderful, gentle woman, sort of like Barbara McClintock was to genetics. That's what Rachel Carson was to ecology. Cool. Underappreciated. Brilliant. Was this kind of like a bellwether, this book? This, this book people? rallied people 
to the environment. It was one of the first environmental treatises that actually had impact on right, the general so, public. To put it in perspective, before yeah. this, yeah. we didn't even think about what we were doing. Of course we not. just made chemicals, bombs, of tractors, pollution. We didn't Got care. It. Well, some of us cared, but not much went on. All right. So and, there was uh, a, another. And she was the first to say, hey, we have to look at. These birds are dying from DDT. No, she wasn't the first. She wasn't the first. Who was, she was before not that? the first? There were what about many Aldo others. Leopold? Was yeah, he yeah, before? No, Aldo Leopold was in there too. What was the name of his book? It was called well, he wrote many, but the one that I Sand most is County, County Almanac. Almanac. That's right. But that's a book about the positivity yes, of I nature. Understand. All right. But there were other people. The guy who wrote the play Hair. Silent instance. Spring. Hair. Who wrote Hair? Let's look that up. <laughs> <laughs> Because that was a 60s play also, but that play was written as a reaction I to I want to know why, you know... Wait a minute, wait a minute. I was not finished yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that play was written in reaction to the beginning of the Vietnam War, which is in the 1960s also. Yeah, I, I still want to know how <clears throat> agriculture recovered. You haven't told I will tell me. you this. Did it? Well, Did it? Well, it took a kickstart after recover? World War II, didn't it? It did at the beginning. It was a And you said that the Dust Bowl activity. was re revivified... What was? <laughs> the Dust Bowl. Or no, they... the Dust Bowl was not revivified. The, bus, the Dust Bowl was revisited. By the time the troops came back from the Second World War, which was in the middle to late 1940s, yes, and they started to go back to where the Dust Bowl used to be, expecting there to be a desert, the prairie grasses had recovered, and a lot of the animals had returned to a place which looked as though that could have never happened again. So nature is very resilient, and there's lots of reasons for that, which we'll get to in many other episodes uh, about urban agriculture. But the point is that uh, the foment was the reaction to the industrial military complex, which, of course, then now President Eisenhower, before that General Eisenhower, warned the public about and said, beware of the industrial military complex because they will do anything – in the name of, and then you can fill in that blank, defense, offense, <laughs> you know, keeping people employed. You know, if you be, make a big list, you can come up with lots of different reasons for justifying your actions without caring about what happens to the environment. And in fact, the military was not ever obliged to clean up their mess. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was left up to the Department of Interior or, or the newly created Environmental Protection Agency, which was created in the 1960s, also by none other than Richard Milhouse Nixon. Hmm. So, 60s ironic, were incredible. <laughs> I mean, I'm a child of the 60s, Vince. I lived through it. I know you're not because you're a later bloomer or I bloomer than I 60s. am. You lived, but you were not as consciously aware of this because you weren't going to go to Vietnam. I got I my draft number. Oh, 1960. How old were you when the war? I was 18 in 19. 60, 72. That's when it ended in 76. Yeah, so 72, I got a draft number, and I would have gone if I had gotten gone. a low enough number. Well, you and I could have been... Did you get a there? draft number? Yeah, sure. What was your number? 28. Wow, I'm surprised you didn't go. Me too. I wouldn't Actually, be sitting here with you today. No, you wouldn't, because I probably would have been... You would have been dead. Cannon fodder, just like the rest I, of you. My number was... 327. <laughs> right. Do you know that I couldn't find it? This is another story for another time, but I couldn't even find a job when I got out of college because my draft number was so low that everybody was convinced that you I would be drafted. drafted. Yeah. I got a job. You'll never guess where. Uh, have you told me? Here. I have. I got a job here. Yeah, doing as a parasitology line. Yeah. Parasitology, but the rest of that story is... It's in TWIP. You can it's listen It's irrelevant to that. for this broadcast. Right. But the point is in the 60s, People began to pay attention. Uh, wait a minute. You've jumped now to the 60s. That's right. And because has the agriculture war ended, done really well up until that point? It did great. Did it boom in California? Of course it did. And the Dust and Bowl, too? And not only did too? it do well, the Dust Bowl had recovered by then, though. It was over with. Because we figured out how to irrigate. In California, we figured out how what to about, irrigate. What did we do? Because you said in the Dust Bowl, no one could figure out how to get water there. Except because of modern technologies, development, and the... Wells. The wells, the aquifer, the Ogallala aquifer, which comes down out of Canada and gets down into Texas mm -hmm. as a V-shaped aquifer. It goes right through the heart of Can not to the heart of Kansas, but through the wheat-bearing uh, zones of Kansas. It goes through North and South Dakota. 
It goes through portions of Nebraska, and all that all water right. can be tapped off. Now, that's old water. That's water that's thousands of years old. Really? And it's very difficult to replace that water. It's, sitting, it's been sitting underground It doesn't for recharge that fast. Wow. So what happened was Texas began to notice that their water supplies were dwindling. Yeah. Because the water further north was being sucked out of the ground. But nevertheless, farming had recovered. Farming had completely but recovered. The, and the using 60s. DDT and plowing technologies and new tractors and, and the Army Corps of Engineers invented new ways of, of mm -hmm. making roads and all kinds of other things. Those technologies were applied to farming. And farming just went crazy, All right, as did the population. We rebounded from a diminished population mm -hmm. during the Second World War to a logarithmic almost growth rate of, of people. So all these things were going on, right? And the, wow, the things looked great. We had tons of food. We had so much food that we began exporting huge amounts of it to other countries. The Marshall Plan was absolutely dependent upon it. What's the Marshall Plan? It was the original way in which the United States government allowed Europe to recover. And the United States uh, uh, International Agency for Development, mm -hmm. USAID, uh, was established as a result of the Marshall Plan. And they okay. continue that work well into, in fact, they're still doing it. Why did you mention hair before? The play Hair. Hair, because in the play Hair, yeah. there's a song called Sulfur Dioxide. Really? It's called Hello, Sulfur Dioxide. And what, what's the significance of that? <laughs> it's all about pollution, Vince. Ah. It's all about pollution. Wow. And it was just one song, but it was a telling song because it meant that not only was the war going on, but the environment here was deteriorating also. This is, hello, sulfur dioxide, hello. <laughs> and there's a whole bunch of other <laughs> noxious chemicals that they were talking about. Yeah. And the air, the air, the air is everywhere. And the, no the one owns the, the, the air. name of the song is Air. Air. Okay, fine. Welcome, sulfur dioxide. That's Hello, right. carbon monoxide. See? The air is everywhere. That's right. That's right. It's a great song. Maybe we should put that up as our pick. Vapor and fume at the stone of my tomb, <laughs> breathing like a sullen perfume. See that? What? Nice. And the play was incredibly <laughs> popular, right? Very popular, yeah. Right. It was all about people trying it to get out of the draft. It was the, it characterized the 60s, basically, of course it did. right? Of course it did. Of course it did. That's right. And it was about one person's, uh, he was drafted, right? And, that, and then his plight during this play as to what happens to him. So the, the American public was divided into two camps. One was a supportive camp for the governmental policies of whatever was going on, including mm -hmm. the way farming occurs because that was being driven by the United States Department of Agriculture and all of these technical schools which were feeding into this growth of the technical ag business, which is now called... Ag chemicals, ag this, ag that. It's big ag. In other words, big agriculture. All right. Now I have two questions. Two? That's all? For now. First, you're, again, you're, Euro, you're U.S. centric. That's Did true. Did Europe also experience no, Europe was recovering from the Second World War. Did, but they didn't have Europe a dust bowl. leveled. They didn't have a dust bowl. They didn't have anything. We didn't bomb the fields. Yes, we did. We bombed everything. The fields? Are you kidding? Do you know what the Russians did? No. The Russians went to, to Russia... The Russians. Did I say Russians? Germans. I meant the Germans. Yeah. The Germans invaded Russia. Right. Do you know what the Russians did as the result? What? They burned everything. Mm. They burned it. They did a reversal on them. They said, you will never conquer us because you will not have enough to eat, and we will make sure of that. We destroyed all of our crops. Guess who suffered? Everybody. Yes, not just the German soldiers, although the German soldiers did suffer greatly for that, but the Russian people too. The Russian government was willing to sacrifice huge numbers of Russian citizens in order to get the Germans to starve. And so not only did the Russians kill off their invaders, they also killed off a lot of their own people. Joseph Stalin, in all his wisdom, that's what he decided to do. Sherman during his invasion of the South, during the American Civil War, burned everything mm -hmm. to starve out the Confederate Army. That's why he's so popular down there right now. That was a joke. 
So, you won't see any uh, statues of right, General so there Tecumseh were, Sherman. There were problems in agriculture. But elsewhere. there's one in New York. <laughs> but by the 60s, agriculture is booming. And we're it's exporting, booming. We're exporting it's food. Crazy. It's going crazy. Big companies are established. My second question. Yes. When did fast food get its grip? Fast food. Because this has an impact on you agriculture, go back to McDonald's? doesn't it? Doesn't yeah, it? yeah, 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 yeah. So, so look up when McDonald's was first established. I can remember one in Fairlawn, New Jersey. When they said hundreds of hamburgers sold. Yeah, I remember. I remember. <laughs> we used to go. It was so exciting. It was in Fairlawn, New Jersey. Now, I grew up in Dumont, which isn't yeah, far away. It was founded in 1940. 1940, but that was with Ray Kruk, right? Now, Ray Kruk was the Burger King guy, wasn't he? I think that was McDonald's. Let's okay. See. Well, I, I don't know the history of this stuff, McDonald's. All right. Wikipedia probably has something on that. But uh, Didn't Ronald McDonald found it? <laughs> The point is that when it was up, it was began as a barbecue restaurant operated by Richard and Maurice McDonald. Right there, you go. They even had their real names. Yeah, no, Croc is somebody else. Ray Croc. Actually, the, he did found the corporation, which That's then right. did the That's franchising. Right. right. Exactly. Okay. So and they bought a lot of agricultural. Oh I mean, my they have God. resulted. They needed everything. The they needed lettuce. They mega, needed pickles. What else did they need? <laughs> Special well, sauce. Potatoes. They needed beef. They needed flour for their buns. They needed lettuce for their salads. They needed all kinds of produce, and they needed lots of it. How but many the Mac- fast foodization. Wait, how many of, McDonald's are there today? How many? Um, how many franchised, franchised like McDonald's? It says here thirty-four thousand plus worldwide. 34,000 fast, and when we say fast food, it means you can drive up in your car, put an order in, and in 10 minutes, you can get what you want. Yeah. Now, you know, it's not all bad. Let's- you know, it's funny. They made $5 billion in 2012. They made five, five and a half billion. That's their profit. <laughs> that- not, I mean, compared to Apple. <laughs> it's so funny that well, with 34,000. Big oil. Big oil is number two, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, food is not a high profit thing. That's why they have to have so many of these this restaurants to and just you have to eke out. And, uh, but you know, this has ruined agriculture because now we have mega farms devoted just to you. supplying these. Are you making a judgment? Are you saying that we shouldn't be producing lots of food? I'm not for the making rest a judgment. I'm just saying it. <laughs> I'm just saying that they have ch- they this. As far as I understand, and this is from a reading of Fast Food Nation, the, the okay. fast food industry was responsible in transforming agriculture in the U.S. I'm sorry. Am I taking away your story? Not at all. No, we're, uh, I've we're having a conversation. Ahead. It's not a story from one person. I've it's, jumped far ahead, but no, you haven't. In not the so '60s, far. I would say this was the growth of the fast food industry. '60s, '70s, and beginning? '80s. The so they. And you're going to tell me this story. When did the mom and pop farms start to be combined into the mega farms that are operated by agro giants nowadays? And they began to fail. When, when was that? To, they fail all the time. Yeah, but I think fast food drove. But there was it. something else that happened. And what that else? was the U.S. Farm Bill. Let's look that up. When was the first U.S. Farm Bill? I don't know. Let's. I, we can find out. You don't know. There's a history of this. I can't know everything. Oh, dear. That's why we have the internet. <laughs> Hopefully it's accurate. <laughs> the primary agricultural and food policy tool of the federal government. Right. And the first farm bill First ever. farm was created during the Great Depression. Oh, I wonder why. Wow, that makes perfect sense. Sure it does. And it uh, just, they pardon the expression, make a profit, grew right? and grew and grew. Now, what does it I understand what it did during the Depression. The current Farm Bill, which was passed just about six months ago, was it's good for the next uh, eight or nine years of uh, U.S. Mm-hmm. agricultural life. It's close to a trillion dollars worth of food aid. Now, a lot of it is devoted to supplying food for people who can't afford food. So that's in the form of food stamps. The food mm-hmm. stamps didn't come in until the 1970s, I think, or 80s, perhaps. The rest of the farm bill is to support farming because we export. Believe it or not, Vincent, you're going to find this number really incredibly hard to believe. But of all the food that's grown in the United States, mm-hmm. how much do you think we export? 70%? 80 Of all the food, that includes not just vegetables, but 80 animal products? 80% of what the agricultural produce, yeah. uh, agricultural products, 80% is exported. So we don't need all the produce, all the stuff we produce, we basically. We feed the world. But we import 
all this all the mechanical stuff that well, we Well, some of that. Some of that. No, but the John Deere cars. tractor company is in uh, Illinois. Mm. And how many tractors does it sell? Many, 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 many. <laughs> yeah. If you travel throughout the Midwest, that's all you see out there is John Deere. Well, you know, all this stuff that's sold at Walmart, it all comes from overseas. You know, Not a lot of it. cars. Only in the wintertime. You know, the container ships come in here, as I you know. know. Oh, I know that. So that all those produce. So with this, uh, yes. All that produce that you see at, at, at places like Costco and Walmart, that's not non-U.S. produce except in the wintertime. Oh, no, I don't mean the produce. I'm meaning the other. Oh, the stuff. stuff. You know, like the plasma screen televisions yeah, and stuff like stuff. this. You're absolutely right. So we export a lot of food. We, food, we feed we much feed of the, the world. world. All right. We make money. So the we do. farm bill is to help farmers do that. That's correct. Keep their production high. There's one. Why don't they reduce their production and just feed the U.S.? <laughs> because then the rest of the world will not be Are our friend. Are you saying we're being altruistic? I'm, no, we're not doing it for that reason at all. Do we we're, sell it at a profit or do we give it away? What do you think? We sell it at a profit. That's exactly right. What is our largest food export? Corn. Hmm. And, and after that, Wheat. Soybeans, wheat, wow. grains. Yeah, grains. All right. So, how did we get so? Wait, wait. There's no. one other component. The, the Farm Act. There's one other component we're not talking about. Farming is not a reliable business model, and that's because the weather varies. That's why every time we have a podcast, no matter which one it is, we both look out the window and then you say, "Well, today it's a nice day and the sun's shining." But you can yeah. go back through the podcast and find. Gee, it looks pretty bad out there. It's raining and it's cold or it's snowing. And look at all that ice on the water. You know what? The weather is something that everybody talks about, but nobody does anything about. That's a very old joke, but it's not a joke. The reason why it's humorous is because it's true. And we do talk about it a lot. And who talks about it more than anybody else, do you think? Farmers. Got it right. And why do they talk about it? There's something well, called the Farmer's Almanac. They depend on the weather, right? If you look right? at the farmer's almanac, it they tries, rain, tries to sun. predict the future. If they don't have good rain, they have a lousy yield, right? Is that possible So to the Farm the Act is to help compensate so they don't go out of business and lose their farm, and then we don't have any farm. Well, it was an attempt to do that. So let me tell you what they did in 1996. Are you aware of that? You're going to tell me, aren't you? So it was originally um, to help farmers in times of trouble. In 1996, the, it was changed uh, so they, they said farmers' incomes should be managed by the free market. They stopped subsidizing right. farmland and purchasing extra grain. Instead, the government began requiring farmers to enroll in a crop insurance program. Crop to insurance program. So what does that mean? Well, my interpretation of this is rather crude. So the listeners that catch this, that know the truth, <laughs> are going to laugh. <laughs> I hope they don't laugh too hard. But my, my interpretation of the farm bill with regards to crop insurance is that if your farm fails and you have crop insurance, mm -hmm. why would it fail, Vince? No rain. Or? Pests. Or? <laughs> too much rain. All right. Too much rain, sure. Right. Too much heat. No, sun, no heat. sun. Too many bacteria. All right. Lots Not of reasons. Bacteria. Name it. There, there are so many reasons for farms failing. It's incredible. Even if you have a great year. Mm -hmm. What if everybody had a great year? Think yeah. that's good for farming? It's too much. Then it's the worst the thing for drop, farming. Right. The prices go right down through the the the, 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 floor. the floor because they'll go through the ceiling when they go up. <laughs> that's true. It depends on where you live. But the point is that farming is the most unreliable business model you could possibly try to propose because it's weather driven, and it's it's commodities driven. Where are the commodities markets handled, by the way? You're sitting here in New York City. No. Where? Chicago. Ah, uh, right. Right. Pork bellies. All that stuff. <laughs> Butter Comes futures. Out of Chicago. Why, does, <laughs> why Chicago? Why? Because in the old days, that's where the stockyards were. Okay. And agriculture sort of converged on Chicago and then got redistributed after that. I'm getting hungry. Me too. <laughs> so, <laughs> but we want to get to a point here, and the point is yeah, this. I understand. Your farm can fail, and if you don't have farm insurance, you're SOL, and everyone All knows right. what that means. Now, if, you're, if you have farm insurance and your farm fails, then if your crop had been produced and it got sold at the rate that almost all the other crops that year got sold at, mm -hmm. for that particular crop, I should say, the farms that didn't fail, right. then you got that much money 
from the crop insurance to cover your losses so that you could farm again the next year. Now, what, if, would, you ha- what well, if that happens two years in a row? Mm-hmm. Well, you keep getting then, insurance, don't you? You take it out for three years. Mm-hmm. And why do you only take it out for three years? Well, if you fail three years in a row, the government's not going to insure you anymore? That's correct. Is that right? So on the fourth year, mm-hmm. what happens to your farm? Um, you have to sell it, probably. Or? The bank takes it. Or? Government takes it. Or? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Government doesn't want your land. Some large corporation comes in and says, we'll, we'll help you. I see. As long as you can grow what we want you to grow. So they do share Here's cropping. what I want you to grow. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want you to grow this. And they'll say, sure, I don't care what I grow. In fact, every year I grew something different depending on what the futures were. The futures, the crop futures, they try to predict mm-hmm. how much wheat will sell for next year, how much corn will sell for, how much soybeans will sell. They try to predict all of those things based on prior year's history and the growth of the industry itself. So, I mean, it's very complicated stuff, and it's not something that a microbiologist that's now preaching about urban agriculture should know much about. But, but by listening to other people talk about this on NPR shows and on, mm-hmm. and on, and on agriculture shows, too, you learn that it's, it's a hell of a life being a farmer. I have deep empathy for farmers. They're, they work hard, long hours, all year long. They think about the future. Even if they have a good year, they don't have time to enjoy it. They sit back and they wonder, what will next year be like? Will I be able to feed my family next year? Will I be able to take a vacation? Will I be able to pay off my debts? Will I? All of these things keep bothering them. Will it rain too much? Will, it, will a tornado wipe me out? Will, will, that's not a good life, Vincent. That's not a good well, life. Well, Dixon, I appreciate it. But a lot of people who are not farmers worry from year to year no, about their job No, of course they do, but well. not about these things. Yeah, least. I understand. All right, so... But don't We don't want to minimize the no, suffering No, we don't, but I'm, I'm going to tell you something. In, in the 30s, the income tax required you to list your profession, as it does today. Mm-hmm. There were 6 million farmers in the 1930s. How many today? 6 million farmers. Today, 159,000 people listed themselves as farmers. Well, no, I made uh, that number up, but I mean, that's the last number I saw where the profession farmer was listed. Yeah. 159,000 people. Number of farms in the U.S. at the moment, 2.2 2 million. No, and that's not what we're asking here because you can have lots of farms. Really? And but, few farmers? Yes. Hmm. That's right. So it was actually stated by the government, the current administration, with Obama that when he took office, he discovered through his Justice Department that only 2% of the farmers controlled ten, uh, 50% of the farmland. Mm. 2% of the farmers. Now, who are those farmers? Take one wild guess. Companies? Big companies? Name Monsanto? Some. There's one. Uh, Cargill. Cargill? Archer Daniels Midland. Mm. Those three companies controlled 50% of the farm. How, how, how does that work? So, so they bought up all the failings. They farms. bought up the failings, and they, they said, we'll pay you a decent wage every year to farm our crops. And they said, that's, that's okay by me because I love farming. I don't care what I grow because every year I grew something different anyway. So if you tell me what to grow, I'll do that. So now we have two crops. Mm. What are they? Corn and soybeans. What? That's all we grow? Corn and soybeans. That's the most of what we grow. Those are huge crops in the United States. Yeah. So is wheat. That's true. What we so, do with soybeans, Dixon. What We re fertilize the soil with them. That's why. Yes. That's what they're so used the, for. The actual beans, do we sell those? The beans, we had to find uses for them. So that required industrialization of that crop. And we did. We made tofu out of it. We made soy milk out of it. We made... The pulp was turned into something else, and we make we meet them. They're called edamame, by the way. Of course, so, the soy is a legume which fixes nitrogen. That's, that's right. Why we covered that last they time. Plant and we alternate planting with other crops. We do corn. So corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans, corn. I must inject also that in many Please. areas of the country, yes. farm lands like here in New Jersey were converted to housing. Right when farms fail, because they get the more farmers, money from the builders than to. Continue You're their right, farms. and you'd think that's a big deal, but it really isn't. So right around the, I know it probably didn't impact anything, Not but in New Jersey it happened a lot because yeah, there used to be a lot more farmland. Right. And in you fact, know, in what my is town, the motto for the New Jersey state, the Garden State. That's right. And in many many housing developments <laughs> in my town were once farms. True. Did you know, farms. by the way, that bird's eye frozen foods 
was invented in New Jersey. Yeah, you said that last time. Yeah. You, you're going to repeat it. People don't like when you Doesn't repeat it. Doesn't matter. Things. No, no, no. They can say, oh, yeah, he did say that again. Yeah. So it sounds to me, yep. even though the individual farmer yep. is no longer, right. there are big farms that are doing very, very well. They're doing great because they work on an average, right? Because if, if they have X number of farms spread out over a large portion of land, mm-hmm. both longitudinally and latitudinally, the chances are, and they've done the math on this, so they can obviously uh, look ahead and predict the future based on what they can see in the past. On average, 80% of these farms succeed. Three hundred and three million farmers in the U.S. Yeah, well, a lot of those are dirt farmers that don't even list themselves. Those are subsistence farmers. I mean, people who consider themselves occupational farmers. Yeah. And that's, there are very few of those people now. So do we, we still export a lot of 80%. Today, we still export 80% of what we grow. What do we, we grow mainly wheat and corn and wheat, corn, grains, soybeans, soybeans. Sorghum. Okay. And, and value-added products There are many on things that. that we do not make that we have to import in the winter anyway, right? That's true. That is very true. But you could imagine making everything here one day, couldn't you? Um, if we were to decide from now on, we're only going to grow food for the United States and that's it. Sure. Yeah. In fact, where do you think most of the food for the United States comes from? If it doesn't come from the Midwest, because you're not eating corn and you're not eating soybeans, where does your food come from? Well, a lot comes from California, right? A lot. And where else? So South America? No, 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 no. In the United States. Oh, in the U.S. Uh, Florida. Yes. And one other state. Mm, uh, Texas? Yes. What comes from Texas? Lots of things. Really? Grapefruits. Oh. Uh, oh, I like grapefruits. Rice. They grow tons of rice. I like rice, In fact, too. there's a university down there with Rice that University? <laughs> Is right. that named after rice? I don't think so. Do you like rice? I love rice. Various kinds of rice. Sure, rice is a favorite staple. Sushi, sushi rice. I like, well, but my favorite is basmati rice. I like that, too. It's very flavorful rice. Yes. But my all-time favorite has become black rice. I never had black rice. It's wonderful. Just had it last night, in fact. It was good. good. What kind of grain so the, is that made from? It's the same kind of... Uh, Why is it black? It just happens to be that color. There's a lot of different colored rices. There's red rice. There's yellow rice. So, Dixon, it's everything's fine. Rice. We make a lot of stuff. We export okay. it. That's the end of this you don't podcast. Need this. You don't need this show. <laughs> <laughs> What's the problem? Are uh, we still in the second green revolution? Yeah, I forgot to mention some other parts of this revolution, which are very important. Let's do One that. One of them is... I mean, we're very efficient, right? We also genetically modified food. How so? Well, when I say food, I'm not really talking about genetic modified food. I'm genetic modified plants. Well, isn't plants food? Sometimes, but it's for value-added products. The answer would be no. If you use them for oils, for instance, for lubrication, or to generate high fructose sucrose, for instance, or high fructose sugar, I should have said. Uh, what about you, for gasoline? Do we genetically modify we, the corn? No, we, we could genetically modify them to produce more starch, which is where yeah. the sugar comes from. Right. So, but we and, and so we modify them to resist droughts. We modify them to resist herbicides. We modify them to resist pests of various kinds. Genetically modified organisms. That's right. And there's a huge pushback on this one. People have reacted negatively and poorly in terms of their information. All right. So I'm a genetist. I'm not a geneticist, but I've done genetics. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm a biologist, and I understand the value of science. And if you're applying science for the right reasons, I'm totally in favor of genetically modifying food. If I'm modifying it to improve the nutritional quality of the food so that people who don't have a proper nutrition suddenly do have a proper nutrition, that's a valid reason, and that food should be consumed. But if I'm modifying a plant that has a higher tolerance for a herbicide that I also produce— that the weeds have suddenly become resistant to because I've overused it. Mm-hmm. And so now I need my crop plants to be more resistant, so I'm sure. going to do it for that reason, then I'm, I'm against it. Okay? Well, I draw the line at that point. So you have to tell me why you're modifying the food first. And it doesn't matter how you modify it, okay? So people don't realize that everything they eat has been genetically modified through artificial selection, every bit of it. There isn't one thing out there that's harvested from the wild except fish. Mm -hmm. Everything else 
didn't look like that when it first started out in nature. And many things were two or three other things before that. Remember, we started to talk about corn production in the Balsas Valley of Mexico right. as being three different grasses that it naturally hybridized together to produce this unusual plant. So, yeah, so the Green Revolution took advantage, uh, the, third, the second Green Revolution took advantage of the fact that we now understood genetics well enough so that we could begin to control the expression of genes that modified the behavior of the plants in favor of more plants. One of them was BT. You know what BT stands for? Bacillus thuringiensis. Yes. And what is that, Vincent? Well, it's a soil-dwelling bacterium. And? And it produces a, a compound that we use it in its spores, I believe, that we use to kill insects. Yeah, how does that work? How does what? Well, the insects eat it. How and, does BT work? Well, the insects eat it. It's and, mechanical. And it breaks their it's guts. It's mechanical. <laughs> It crystallizes under acid conditions into a crystal, which causes them to become constipated. Yeah. And they can't defecate. And they die. All right? So if you have an acid gut tract, as most mammals do, then this protein, which is soluble under basic pH conditions encounters an acid pH and it crystallizes. It forms a pure, a perfect pure crystal of BT toxin. You know, you can, uh, well, it's a, it's in the spore. It's a toxin. And it's also been genetically introduced into crops. That's exactly right. So what do you suppose happened there? The Israelis did this, in fact, with tomatoes. And what do you think happened? Because they had plant pests that were eating their tomatoes. So they just said, you know what? If we took this protein from BT mm -hmm. and inserted it into the genome of the plant, every time an insect took a bite out of this plant, it would be like BT bacteria being swallowed by the insects, and they would die. And in the beginning, this worked perfect. Yeah, what, they got resistance, right? No, they didn't get resistance. The, the, the tomatoes didn't taste good? The tomatoes tasted great. People didn't want it. People loved them. What was the problem then? I asked first. <laughs> uh, what do you think happened? So they didn't get resistance, right? Yeah, they didn't get resistance. The yield is low? Nope. Of the plant? Nope, keep guessing. Um, what is it, the oh, I know what happened. Uh, I know what happened. Yes, he does. Yes, he it does. It killed beneficial organisms, mm, like butterflies. Some of, some of, well, they don't usually eat the tomato plants, so that was not a problem. It got into the environment. No. All right. Well, I've just guessed give that. Up? I give up. Okay, fine. The, the problem was, of course, nature. Nature selects for organisms that are better adapted to a changing environment through random selection of genes that have already mutated. I, just, I said they got resistance. They didn't get resistance. Something else happened. Remember, this, this protein doesn't crystallize unless it's under acid conditions. You'll never guess what happened, so I'll just tell you. Insects started to eat the tomato plants that had alkaline gut tracts. Their physiology... There are such insects? Well, apparently, that's what these plants so in other words, selected for. The acid gut tract containing insects went away. Correct. And they were replaced by a different that's crop right. or it breed. It was the same species of insect with an alkaline gut tract. Are you saying they were selected for? They were selected for by the BT containing plants. And their guts are fine with alkali in them? <laughs> yeah, apparently, alkaline so. PH? Wow. apparently so. All right. So nature in this case abhors a vacuum and it says, you know, you guys really need to eat those tomato plants and here's how to do it. So they didn't um, And all those, they don't use it anymore because of well, this? Well, they can't because those insects are now now you've got Ones with acidic gut tracts and ones with basic gut tracts. And well, it doesn't you know, matter. basically, whatever we try, there's going to be nature is going to evolve. So that's around my it, right? point. So that's my point. So when you start to modify plants to resist higher levels of herbicides, what's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? Oh, you're going to get similar selections for something else. The, the weeds will start to grow. At, at, you're still going to get weeds that have higher and higher tolerances to the. To the herbicide. So yeah, eventually yeah. they'll be back up to where they were before. So then you'll have to do it again. So are again, you saying that we shouldn't even try? Well, we've spent a lot of money on these things, and nature really reacts so very fast. So what do fast. we do? What do we do? You just let the insects eat everything? 
<laughs> well, that happens in many places. Why don't we plant a crop for the insects and a crop for us? Well, there is something called a Mexican garden. That's that? Now that you bring this up, because the Mexican garden is one which has uh, been uh, embraced by ecologists as the most ecologically viable form of agriculture. Mm-hmm. And that is, here's a typical Mexican garden, okay? In row number one, you have in hole number one, the seed of a pepper plant. In hole number two, you have the seed of a corn plant. Mm-hmm. In seed number three, you have the corn, uh, the berry plant. In seed, in hole number four, you have um, a wheat plant. In other words, your diversity of the garden mm-hmm. is so um, robust that a, a particular plant pest can't really find all of the plants of the same kind in this garden because there are so many other plants that mask the odor that the plants give off to attract the insects to them. So that's a Mexican garden. So, But they're impossible to commercialize. <laughs> you couldn't design a yeah. harvesting device. Right, right. And it's hard to plant, too, so, I would guess. And it's hard to plant. But the point is, if you do it that way, mm-hmm. on an individual basis, you're in, you're in like, you're, you've got it made. Okay. But that's not a commercial solution. So the best, what is the best way, and I'll, I'll, I'll use an analogy here, too, because I know you know this answer as well. What is the best way to prevent somebody from catching malaria? Window nets, mosquito screens on the windows. Really? Is that the very best way? The very best way? The very best way to prevent someone from catching malaria. Uh, right. There are a couple of ways, okay? <laughs> you could have them go live where there's no f- mosquitoes. Thank you! Thank you! <laughs> but that's hard. No! We don't have any mosquitoes in this country that carry malaria. Well, uh, but in Africa, people want to live there, and no, they but can't... I, no, but I'm, so I'm making an analogy here. So the yes. best way to protect your plants from insect pests... Plant them where there's no pests... Plant them where the pests can't go. Well, the pests will get there eventually. You know that they will find a way in. You know, everybody out there that's listening to this podcast will say, <laughs> he's right, because greenhouses, although they're great. Right. They have doors. They have, they have windows and doors, and in fact, they leave them open. And yeah. you get insect pests coming in, like whitefly and aphids and all kinds of aphids, and all kinds <laughs> of other... <laughs> <laughs> okay. All kinds of other insects yeah. that can and plant bacteria and viruses... It's a plethora of invaders. So greenhouses, insecure greenhouses, Mm -hmm. are horrible. Well, let's go to the hospital and make the same analogy. You've got the open wards with people sleeping, you know, in room to room to room that are cross-contaminating each other. Right. But those people don't have infectious diseases. What happens, though, if you've got a patient that comes in and he has an immune deficiency or she? Where do you put them? ICU. ICU, right. So the ICU does what? Isolates them. Thank you. So what's wrong with having an ICU for our plants? Very expensive. ICUs are terribly expensive places to Only be for in the people. Hospital. I'm not talking about that kind of a barrier. We don't have to create that stringent a barrier in order to allow plants to escape from many, not all, many of these pathogens. But hmm. the comeback so that statement is, what happens if your plants get contaminated by something outdoors? What is the consequence? Well, the plant is destroyed, so you can't sell it, right? And then what? You plant you a do? new crop the next year. The next year. Right. And what if that same event happens indoors? I suppose you could clean up and plant right away. Thank you. Because you're not restricted by, by climate. So it's becoming obvious that there are some really great advantages to planting indoors mm-hmm. if you could do it. Well, people have been doing that now, right? Well, we're going to get to that part. But the point is that that you talk about perfect storms. We have mm-hmm. one other big issue to discuss before we conclude today's okay. final I think this podcast is over because everything is fine with farmers. Right? <laughs> you ask any farmer and they'll tell you otherwise. What's the biggest issue on their mind right now? Do you think? Uh, must be viruses. <laughs> yes, the kind that make you sick. <laughs> <laughs> Vincent, you are mono, you're monocultured. <laughs> monocultured. The biggest issue on farmers' minds, yeah, these are the farmers who farm crops, not animal Outdoor farmers. farmers. Outdoor farmers. Crops. The weather. Yeah. That's right. And that is driven by? That is driven by the ocean. Climate. Well, isn't climate, the weather, the same thing? No, Tell me what the difference not. is. Weather is day to day. And climate is? Trends. 
trends over over decades usually. So you don't say when you get up in the morning, what's the climate today? <laughs> no. They, <laughs> in fact, when you get up, you say, what climate do I live in? I live in a temperate climate. Okay. Or I live in a tropical climate. Or I live in a subtropical. So farmers are worried about the climate. They sure are. Why are they worried? Well, they're always worried. They worry about whether they plant and grow and harvest under ideal conditions. And those conditions are hard to define unless you know something about the patterns of weather, the yeah. soil types, the rainfall, all of those things play into this and the temperature profiles for the year, right? It's an ecological problem that you're facing, except for one big difference. You're growing a single entity. Mm -hmm. So people who call this agroecology are looking at their cells in the mirror and fooling themselves because it's not ecology at all. It's anti-ecology. Ecology is all about biodiversity. Ecology is about natural selection for the plants that are best suited and the animals that are best suited to live in that zone, and that's called an ecosystem. Don't make any mistakes about this, folks. A farm is not an ecosystem by any stretch of any imagination. But it does it has nothing to do with right. nature. It has ecotones, though. It is contrived. It creates them, <laughs> in fact. The ecotones, besides being a yeah. 60s singing group that sounded the very best in the boys' room, by the way, uh, was to make barriers between yeah, these farms, right? Sure. Of course. Um, That's the problem that most people worry about for genetically modified food items because the wind blows free. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay, true. So that climate, makes perfect sense. Then that, that Climate change is the enemy of the farmer. Right. How do you confront that? You go somewhere where the climate doesn't change. Good luck on that one. You're going to move your farm? Mars. <laughs> Mars. <Yeah. laughs> I thought you said Mars. You can't said, control the Mars. climate. You can't control the climate. It can't be controlled, so you have to come up with some of the other strategy. Mm -hmm. Eventually, all of these grow zones. Why, why Dixon? We're doing all right. We're feeding 80% of the world or whatever it is. Why do we have to change anything? The equation is starting to tip. Maybe next time you'll talk about that. The population continues to increase. Yes. Urbanization continues to increase. That means less farmland? No, it means less farmers. And it means that farming is failing in the regions where urbanization is the most intense. China, India, Southeast Asia. Those areas are experiencing mm -hmm. huge climate change issues related to the monsoons. And the monsoons either come early, dump a lot of rain and leave, right. flooding everything, and then there's protracted droughts, or you get severe weather. And severe weather is a characterization, it's a characteristic, I should say, of, of transitions of climate changes from a stable climate to an unstable climate. And the, the, the non-stable component of the climate that's most obvious to the uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change is greenhouse gases. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm sure everybody's going to say, oh, I knew it was that kind of a show to begin with. Yeah, he's, <laughs> all he's going to do is bash the government and bash fossil fuel users and bash. It's not a bashing. It's a simple admission that this is a problem that needs to be solved. How can we deal with increased greenhouse gases and still have a life that's compatible with the lifestyles that we have now. How can we move forward in our history and not become another extinct species of mammal? And so urban agriculture has real possibilities for saving large swaths of human population from extinction by supplying them with food within the environment that they live. That's the whole idea about this. And if this were 20 years ago or 30 years ago that we were starting this podcast, people might accuse me of smoking the wrong product, <clears throat> so to speak, and daydreaming and uh, having these wild machinations about the future of the world as it might be rather than the way it is. But today, this is mainstream thinking. There's a report on this, right? There's a report just came out on Monday from the United Nations. There were, this was seven years in the making. These are multinational uh, scientific panels that measured everything they could with regards to the effects that climate have on the growth of or on the geology of or on the weather of. Everything was thrown into the mix. Strategic uh, panels were formed for 
the statistical analysis portions for the data sets uh, accumulation of, of uh, summary statements uh, from around the world. They used core samples from ice sheets. They used uh, borer samples from trees. They used uh, migration of, of plants and animals as an index of whether the climate was changing in that particular area because uh, they knew what the tolerance zones were for these. And that requires a lot of input from, from scientists. And, and Landsat photographs, by the way, had, had really played a big role in all of this. But now that we can look back at Earth from 300 miles up, we can tell exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. in, a min in an instant, we can tell you where all the plants are, and we can tell you what kind of plants there are and what they're doing. And that includes crop plants, too, by the way. So it's a real advantage to be able to get a snapshot of the Earth every four hours as this satellite uh, traverses the Earth. There are eight of them up there right now taking pictures every day, every day, every day. And when you put all that data together, you come up with some conclusions that are disturbing and unsettling and unnerving and uh, uncomfortable. So what was Al Gore's movie called? Uh, an, an, an inconvenient, an inconvenient truth. truth. Inconvenient. It's inconvenient. This we just report, don't want to hear this. This report said, unless the world changes course immediately <clears throat> and dramatically, the fundamental systems that support human civilization are at risk. That's right. They say that climate change is impacting uh, everything. They have evidence That's that right. the climate change destabilizes nations. Right. And its effects on crops, water supplies, and human health, sure. plus species loss. Of course. The cool thing about this uh, is that the 44-page summary was agreed to line by line by scientists and politicians from more yeah. than 110 governments. How many governments are there? Over 170. 92. 192 altogether listed okay. for the United Nations. And you know, 180 of them listened to TWIP. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So but 110 out of 192, that's not enough. We need 192. Agree. So, you know, the people here in the U.S. who say there is no climate change, they're yeah. simply No, no, they wrong, don't think that they? there's no climate change. What they think is that humans are not responsible for the change in climate. Really? That's what they believe. Because if you were to take responsibility for some part of this, then you might say, well, it's our job to do something about that then. Yeah. Okay. So the rate of climate change is what we're concerned with. Not whether or not climate changes. Climate's always going to change. That's the, the nature of the earth. Yes. But how fast it changes is driven by certain things, and that's called forcing. All right? This is the term that, that atmospheric scientists use for forcing. Okay? We have forced the earth to warm up by placing more uh, UV slowing down. UV slowing down. So this is a consequence of carbon Utilization is that correct? Yes, because CO two is a better interceptor of UV, yeah. and so by the way, so is methane. We should say that methane. But the the, the old time champion is of course uh, water vapor. Well, the atmosphere is mostly water vapor. If you look at the gases in the atmosphere, it's mostly water vapor. That's a constant. That's going to slow the sunlight down enough to create a twenty degree centigrade temperature throughout the world on average. But when you start throwing in other gases into that mix, the temperature can go up. And it's it, we've shown that consistently. We've shown that the temperature has gone up. It's minuscule amounts. People don't believe the one degree change in annual temperature difference is enough to make a difference in the way life behaves on Earth. But that's a huge amount of energy when you add up how much energy that equals. A 1%, a one, one degree change in, in the amount of energy that stays on the earth that mm -hmm. ordinarily would have escaped back into outer space. So to know this on a global scale is the, the, the part that we're having difficulties transmitting to the general public because they can't imagine the entire earth as a system. Well, you know, part of the problem is Dixon, people just want to go about their daily lives. Yeah, it's disturbing. And that involves yeah, driving yeah, a car, right, burning right, things, right, flying, right. and so forth. But you know, the interesting thing here. What Vincent, do we do? The interesting thing is <laughs> yes. that every time we've had a change that's resulted in a healthier environment, we've all benefited. Tell me one. Uh, fluoridation of water. That's a good vaccination. That's another. In other words, we've used science to solve health issues. And this is science trying to solve the biggest health issue. Would if everyone in the world switched to an electric automobile, would that help? It depends on where they get their electricity from. You know, that's the problem with electric vehicles is it has to come from someplace, right? If I got it from hydropower, the answer is absolutely. Should That'd we switch to... Solar. 
Nuclear powered Solar. power plants? Nuclear powered plants, if they're correctly monitored and yeah. and they're of the state of the art, of course. They don't then, increase greenhouse gases, right? No, they don't. They're, they're not polluting at all if they're done properly. Now, France generates 70% of its energy from So nuclear. we got scared years ago because of know, a few incidents, Island, right? Yeah, of course. Well, there have been some remarkable incidents like uh, Fukushima, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl. There are always going to be errors because we're human. And that's what the <laughs> opponents of this say. Well, the, Why the, bother? The alternative is we have no earth left. When there's a big <laughs> error in this... Everybody suffers. Yeah, of okay. course. So New York City, by the way, gets 20% of its power. I'm pointing my finger Indian up the river. Point. Yeah. 20%. But they're going to shut it off, aren't they? What happens when they decommission that? Where does the other Why? Do I, because it's so from? close to a major city, they want to decommission it? No. It's old. Yeah. You know, that stuff wears out after a while. I understand. It fatigues, as they would say. So it's a problem. It's a conundrum. We are facing major issues at our, everywhere we look. I look at it as a challenge. So do I. And you know what the solution is? Well, think harder. Viruses. <laughs> think harder. Think more collectively. Think as a unit. Think together. Think positively. Think creatively. Try things that haven't been tried before. Don't be negative. Be positive, and and you'll succeed. <laughs> Are you going to next time tell us oh, next time. your solution? You want to talk about next time? Well, we have to stop soon because we've been talking for an hour and a half. Oh, that's fine with me. Though, what, I, what are we going to talk about next time? I, mean, I We could talk about these three topics for a longer time, of course. What three topics? The, the history of farming, the current status of farming, and the future of farming. We haven't talked about the future of farming. Well, let's talk about that next time. Bingo. Can you also talk at some point about what happens when you fertilize farmland? You bet. I think that's an issue, isn't it? It's a huge issue. We've got some negative aspects to talk about as as well. But it'll sound like I'm bashing farming, and the answer is I don't have any intent at all for doing that. Of course not. Farming got us to where we are. You're trying to ensure that farming continues productively for the next thousand years. That's right. If farming could occur without harming the environment, it would be a perfect solution to the growth of human population. Farming without harming. Right. (laughs) Maybe that's the name of our show. No, we've harmed this show. This show, we've harmed a lot of things. <laughs> Maybe next show, we'll be farming without harming. Farming without harming. We'll have to today come. is uh, today is about what happened to the second green revolution. It is failed. It? it failed. Actually, it failed. Why did it fail? We're making food, Dixon. It failed because we failed to take into account the evolutionary process through which plant pathogens, plant. Uh, attacking insects of various sorts, how they evolve their own lives to compensate for all of the roadblocks that we've put in front of them to keep them away from our crops. And we've not been able to keep them away from our crops. And in fact, we're behind the eight ball with regards to uh, invading weeds and fungi. There's something you haven't told us, and I hope you tell us next week. <clears throat> Uh-oh. We are, we're running out of land. Well, if we continue to grow our population this way, the answer is yes, we are. Aren't we going to? Isn't the population going to continue growing? Well, we don't know about that. I mean, I think the population estimates from most of the conservative groups, like the Population Council and the United Nations, and Mm -hmm. um, there are some other groups out there that also track human population trends. And the the current estimate is Mm -hmm. that. And in the next 40 to 50 years, yeah. the human population will peak and plateau at around 10 to 11 million, billion people. Really? Right now it's at 7.1. It's going to peak. Right? Why is it going to peak? Because we can't sustain anymore? Well, because there are places in the world where the population is actually dropping right now. It's Italy, I know. No, all of Europe. Really? All of it. How about the U.S.? No, it continues to grow because we have an open enrollment program, so to speak, from mm. immigration. But... If you go to Japan, if you go to Korea, those populations are decreasing. Everywhere you have a large growth in the middle class, you have a decrease in the human population. Mm -hmm. Name the two biggest countries in the world in terms of that growth of your middle class, India and China. Mm -hmm. They will eventually reach a plateau in their population where they won't have any more population growth. But in the less developed countries, and that's... An enormous number. Of the 192 
countries listed on the United Nations docket, about 47 of those countries are less developed. Mm -hmm. And in every single one of those countries, every single one, the populations are going up. Every single one. What, was that, what does that tell you about the relationship between population growth and individual human wealth? Yeah, as you get wealthy, you don't want to reproduce. That's right. Not as much anyway. So isn't that the solution then? If, if everybody out there is so concerned about the population growth, just take a little money out of your pocket and send it to somebody that has less than you do. Tell Bill Gates. <laughs> well, Bill Gates Jr. actually tries to do that, actually. He's taken a lot of money out of his pocket, and he's tried to help the people that need it well, most. He's, he's doing medical things, which he's is great. He's doing medical things. You know, he's also doing educational things. It wouldn't things. help to give everyone $1,000. And tell that to Warren Buffett. Well, Warren Buffett is going to give his money to Bill Gates Jr., so that's <laughs> maybe that doesn't solve that problem too much. But do you know? How many billionaires there were listed on Fortune 500 last year in the United States? I bet you can find out just by typing that little question out on your laptop. I think the number was over a thousand. Why should there be billionaires? Does that's this a, stimulate that's not my question? Does that's, this stimulate the world? Every, every one of them has a foundation, and every one of them has a, an axe. Yeah, they have to, to give grind. it away, but they give away because they don't give good it away. for tax. No, 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 that's not giving it away. How many billionaires are there? I'm working on it. Okay. Just keep talking. They just published that number, and I thought the number was 1,000, but I wasn't sure. Full list of billionaires in the U.S. Right. Uh, just in the U.S., that's right. 1,426. Look at that. Look at that. Just in the United States, we have 1,400 people that have a billion dollars or more. It's a lot of people. How many billions is that? You know what it was... This is the thing that was really disturbing Bill Moyers once recently to realize that if you took just the top 10... That's actually in the whole world, 1,246. Oh, okay. If you took the top top 10% of income to people and yeah. put them in one place, they would have the same wealth as 4.5 billion people below them wow. altogether. Yep. Which tells you something about hoarding i guess and you know greed if i had a I billion say greed, uh, you know again i'm going to get a lot of comments on this it's not about greed necessarily it's about being clever enough to accumulate wealth at what expense you know you if you're communist you think it's about at the expense of everybody else i don't believe that for a minute there's another book out there that i i don't recall the title of that says that everybody can be wealthy in fact there's a book called abundance and i know who wrote that one by peter diamandis and the book has as its premise that wealth is something that can be shared among every human being. I think you're starting to preach. Well, it's a little preachy, but... Uh, uh, and this is not what people came to urban agriculture No, they didn't, for. they didn't come to hear this. You could cut this part out if you want. But. Well, I, I won't cut it out, but I do think we should wrap this show up. Yes. And next week we're going to talk about... The future of farming. All right. And today's is going to be called Failure of the Second Green Revolution. Is that right? Uh, I think we should just call it the Second Green Revolution. That was last time. Was it? Yeah, it oh, was. Dear. Now we'll talk about it in the post. What shall we talk about in terms of, what, which, what, what shall we call this one then? Well, in the post show we'll talk about it. Okay, uh -huh. we, don't, we don't have to uh -huh. keep people... Uh -huh. Paradise, no, no. I, <laughs> Paradise a, Lost? Yeah, Paradise Lost. The Second Green Revolution, Colin, Paradise Lost. You're not very good with titles, you know that? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, you're, 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 it's because you're just like a traditional guy. Um, I'm old school. That right, has let's, to be right. Dixon, uh, yes. do we want to answer people's questions? Of course. Send the comments and questions to urbanag at urbanag.ws. Right. And when this show is on iTunes, we'll tell you. We yes. haven't got it there yet. <laughs> You can, where can people find you, Dixon? Well, they can find me in several places. They can find me in Fort Lee, New Jersey, for one. <laughs> I'm in the telephone book, by the way. <laughs> they can find me at trichinella.org or medicalecology.org. Yes. Or verticalfarm.com. Hmm, what's that, Dixon? We will talk about that in the future. Not now. Not now. It's Not part next of, time. It's part, of vertical, it's part of urban agriculture. It's one part, right? Yeah. Not the only part. And, of course, people can also find you at urbanag.ws. And they can find me on Twiv, and they can find me on Twip. You know, we need to do uh, someday, we need to get you on Twitter. 
<laughs> because people would love to interact with you. I'm not sure I want to do that. You don't understand. I don't that. have the time for it. You have plenty of time. I see you sleeping out there all the time. That's, that's exactly my point. <laughs> I'd have to give up my nap time in order to answer the tweets. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. Thanks for listening, everyone. See you next time on Urban Agriculture. See you upstairs at the farm.